this might be a wonderful way to get your reps in. And that's the secret to trading is getting your reps in. Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 3rd, 21st, 2024. And this is the Week Ahead Charts. I want to thank all you guys and girls for today tonight. I appreciate you taking times out of your busy schedule. I know how that is. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading. Your favorite stock in crypto picks. If you type in a symbol or please type in the actual tickle, ticker, the tickle, <laughs> and uh, hit return. That way I know which ones we covered and which ones we didn't. We'll go to crypto first when we get the live charts, and then we'll go. I'll take a, a quick look at the overall stocks, give you my two cents on stocks and sectors, and then we'll look at your individual stocks. And the main topic tonight I want to cover or I want to wrap up the series on things that I wish someone would have told me about trading. We're on part 11. You know me, once I get started something, I just keep going and going and going. And we'll probably revisit a lot of these because I found myself tonight wanting to go off on so many different tangents when I was putting slides together. So we'll revisit it over time. I believe it is a lot of things that technically could never end, right? Trading is trading. That's something I've been talking about quite a bit lately and I guess forever. You're trading traders and not markets. And I'm going to show you how sometimes you can just buy crypto that's going up. And sometimes you use the core methodology in crypto, and I'll flesh that out in just a minute. I'm, I'm going to follow up on a lot of the setups or all of the setups we talked about last week. And we're still long, I think, everything we talked about. Uh, mystery charts in action, a mystery chart follow up. I'm going to give you a reveal of mystery chart tonight. And then, of course, your questions on trading. If you're in YouTube, we're doing this live and go to webinar. And the link for that, we'll probably keep it and go to webinar for a while. I'm trying to work on the simulcast between the two. I can never say that word <laughs> in case you're wondering. But I'm working with the simulcast to see how that works out for now. Uh, eventually, we might migrate to one platform or the other. The uh, go to webinar platform, which would be davelander.com slash webinar, is a little bit more interactive. I have to go and check on YouTube. But uh, I'm very happy that you're on YouTube. And again, we might migrate over to that eventually so that's part of the testing we're doing and appreciate uh, everyone's patience while we're working on this anyway if you want to attend live again you can go here or you go to my youtube channel and then i'm on tiktok now and i'm also on x and my x is t following moron which we're going to talk a little bit about in just one second there's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or is often summing up all predictions are about the future a lot of stuff can happen between now and then, all right, it's not about the crypto. You're trading traders, not markets. So here's one from last week. And you can see that's the trades that I grabbed last week. And in this particular one, the entry was right here. It was a little bit of a pullback, a little bit of a TKO into the 30 EMA. Also a Landry Light pullback, it, by the way, the ledger like pullbacks are just kind of blowing my mind. And I know I'm a nerd, but using the 30 EMA, you trade these pullbacks at the 30 EMA when they begin to bounce off of that 30 EMA. In other words, waiting for an entry, just like you trade a normal pullback. I'm amazed at how many stocks set up with this pattern. And this, by the way, a little bit of a double top knockout, had a minor double top, had a nice little knockout move here. And part of this was just buying crypto that goes up. When crypto's hot, and, and believe me, crypto cooled off over the last week or so, as you probably know, but it heats up again really quick. And I pretty much have a full portfolio right now. I don't really have room for anything else. But when it does heat up, it starts going straight up like it was in early March. Sometimes you could just buy the ones that are going up. And I'll take a look at that when we get to the live charts in just a few minutes. Anyway, uh, in this particular account, I was just putting like $1,000 on each pair. And I made a mistake, a fat finger order. And ended up with an extra $466. And the second mistake I made, and Linda Rasky in her book, Trading Sardines, excellent book, by the way. I encourage you to read that. She said that you should correct mistakes immediately. I have a bad habit of letting things happen. I know you can't get a little bit pregnant. It's not that big of a position, so I really wasn't that worried. So it, it happened to be profitable at the time. And I said, well, let me just let her rip and see what happens. So in crypto, by the way, what I've been doing is just looking for a 20% profit target because these things move so fast. Another 20%, a lot of times, isn't that big of a deal. And sometimes I get that within 
hours in crypto. I mean, crypto is just a crazy market. The cycles are ridiculous. The bull market, bear markets, they come along every couple of weeks. And if you're willing to just not care, you'll find yourself do really well. Anyway, so just to keep things easy, I've been using a 20% IPT in stocks that would depend on the volatility of the stock where that IPT is. In, in more mature markets, you definitely want to make sure you do that. And as crypto begins to mature, I'll probably do more and more of that type of uh, profit target setting. In something like Bitcoin, which is a more mature market, as opposed to the shit coins, SHYT are all coins. Um, every trader I know calls them shit coins, SHYT. But anyway, and those, they're just wild and crazy. And I find 20% is a good round number for now. Eventually, I might look into historical volatility and range and all those other good things that I use to kind of set a stop in an IPT. The IPT, by the way, is the entry minus the stop. And that's why I often say kind of intermingle those two things and if you go to davelander.com slash members dash resource there is a spreadsheet that i moved outside of the firewall so uh if you want to download that spreadsheet you could put your own trades in and put your account size in and it'll do some calculations for you if you can figure out your entry and your protective stop everything else is just a mathematical calculation so anyway i took off half the shares at 20 percent so that's $876 coming off. It's $143 in profit. So obviously it's twice that in profits. So it's 283, which is a pretty good return pretty quickly, by the way. You annualize that. It's just ridiculous. Even ludicrous would say it's ludicrous. But you can see it ran up 59%. And since last week, all of these have really pulled back. But the beauty of it, and I was thinking about this earlier, is when you're taking this hybrid approach to money management, where you're taking off half of your shares, it's much easier to ride out these longer term trends as opposed to a full position size. And drawdowns, as you probably know, if you've been trade following for more than a few weeks, can really be abysmal if you're putting on a full share size and you're trying to capture that longer term trend because your stop's going to be, have to be really wide. But if you're trying to just capture a little pop, a little swing trade, then you can take half your money off. You could use a much tighter stop. And then if things begin to work, as I preach, you could slowly and gradually open up your stop over time. And a lot of times that just means doing nothing. If the stock goes up a few cents, you don't do anything. I call that keep the change. And then there's another little technique I use called gaining ground. Let's say you're blessed and the stock goes up three points. Well, maybe you only bump your stop two points and you want to gradually open up to that longer term volatility. And as I've said quite a bit, I thought everybody in the world knew this. And I was on a, a project, it was kind of like a pinch me moment. The project didn't last long, unfortunately. And it wasn't because of performance. Uh, we had amazing performance on this project. We had a bunch of the who's who in the trading world, uh, Larry McMillan and Greg Morris, and the list goes on and on. And I know I would forget half the people that need recognition. That's why I'm not gonna try to name them all. But we had one guy on the team and his name was Jan, and he was looking at my performance because he tracked everybody's performance. And then in the meeting in front of all these people who are just, you know, mentors for me. He said, that's pretty cool what Dave's doing with the trading for the short term and hanging on to a piece and letting that stop widen out. And I was amazed that I thought everybody was doing that. So it just was, I know I'm, I'm just kind of bragging here, being a little narcissist, but that was kind of a pinch me type of moment. And then I later saw, met Larry for the first time in person, Larry McMillan, and I reached out my hand and said, I'm Dave Landry. He goes, I know who you are because you were on fire in that project. I was like, oh, he knows who I am. Anyway, so mark to market on this, thousand bucks left open. So there's the original investment, so to speak, or margin, however you want to look at it. Uh, minus 1466 or 1466, 876 comes off the table. You take it off half at that IPT. And normally at a thousand bucks, I'd be 200 bucks. In this case, like I just said, 286. And then the mark to market, once again, is a thousand bucks. So that's four to $14 on a 1466 investment. And that's a 28% return. And as you can see, this thing ran 59% pretty quickly before it pulls back. By the way, since I've been taking these partial profits, it, oh, by the way, by the way, as I've said before, old guys rule when it comes to crypto. The, you guys who have been, and girls who have been around for a while, you know how the money management works. You know how crazy these markets could be. It, it kind of reminds you of 1999 in stocks, right? So 
you know it's not going to last forever, but you can go in and make a little money, use some money management as opposed to just getting caught up in the crypto. I have seen some people do amazing things in crypto. One guy made 40% his first month. He, he asked me, can I expect this every month? <laughs> I did the math on that. You'd be a billionaire within five years, I think. I think he was like 188 million within three years or something. And I'm like, no, and I think he's since blown up. But that's another story. Anyway, uh, being able to ride out these swings makes it a lot easier with only a half a position on it. And the whole thing, by the way, is a lot easier. It's easy and fun. Not that trading should be fun, but it's fun for me because I'm I'm trading at a small size. And I was trading at a much larger size or somewhat larger size, I should say, in crypto. And I found that it just was um, the swings were just wild and crazy. And now I'm just trading in a smaller size and just growing the accounts, kind of more of a game for me. And that's when trading becomes really great is when you do sort of make it a game. A little hard to make it a game with the bigger accounts, you know, and I, I get that. But with the crypto, I could care less if they all blew up tomorrow, I could care less. I'm not saying that crypto is a good investment. We're trading here. A lot of them are total BS. And that's why, even though some of you may find it rude, I, I still call them shit coins because, <laughs> you know, you don't want to fall in love with these things, believe me. And a lot of these ones that like this last, the four or five we're looking at tonight, six months from now, they'll probably two out of three of them or four out of five of them however you want to look at it, might be down to zero. But who cares if we can get a little piece out and we can ride them for a while. Anyway, you can see the trades down below. And basically this week, I'm just kind of following up on everything. Oh, the second thing I wanted to say uh, earlier is that with crypto especially, by taking those half profits off, you know when they have these amazing runs, like I don't know what this one is, 100%, I think, it's going to have a deep retrace. And sometimes that 30 EMA is so far away. Not that you always want to use that as your stop or whatever, but a lot of times a market can have these amazing runs like this fetch.ai. You guys know what these guys do? I have no idea. I don't care. Whenever I find myself Googling what they do, I was like, ah, stop it, because I'm going to confuse the issue with facts. But anyway, if you could ride out some of these deep retracements in here, and with only half the shares on at a small size to begin with, you're going to be amazed that you're, you're able to catch these longer-term trends in, in something as wild and crazy as these chick ones. Anyway, 20% uh, profit target there. And you can see just really small, this was either done in a smaller account of the smallest accounts or whatever, smallest of the small, or I only had $667 left in my account because the slots were filled up elsewhere. And so that's all I put into this. So you see 398 came off for a 64, a whopping $64 profit. Now, the other thing I've been doing lately, as I've been saying quite a bit, a few years back, I tried mining so to speak by trading shit coins and just keeping a little piece of, of each one so let's say this fetch ai i'd end up with 25 or 50 dollars worth of it and i just keep it okay just in case one of them took off and i know that goes against what i believe in but i thought it'd be a fun little project i as i said ad nauseum i've looked into miners before of course i am because i'm such a nerd and you can get one on ebay for about 200 bucks i think you might even be able to get a new one or fairly uh not too old and if you plug it in, it will lose $10 a day mining Bitcoin. So uh, the technology changes really fast. I don't think it's feasible for an individual, at least in this day and age, to, to mine Bitcoin. Maybe five years ago or 10 years ago, it would have been much, much, much more feasible. Uh, the first guys that did it, they had uh, they made a lot of money. One guy, I guess, early in the process has $100 million in his hard drive worth. It's probably worth a billion now because that was back when Bitcoin was like $4,000. And he petitioned a dump to go dig through the garbage to try to find it. But uh, that's gone. That's another story altogether, though. But anyway, so what I do is there's no commissions. And in, in, uh, well, there's small commissions, I should say, in these um, cryptocurrencies. And I, I'm old school because I've been around for a while. And I'm used to paying a big commission on, on trades. Not anymore, but you're, you're paying some way or the other. Believe me, they're getting your... They're getting your order flow. You you pay, you're paying a little extra skittage or something. There's no free lunch. But anyway, I kind of see it as just paying my commissions in here. Where when I hit the IPT, I'll take $25 off, and that's my mining, so to speak, and I'll put that into Bitcoin. 
And in this particular case, in a lot of uh, in all my crypto, especially once they start moving, I'll put a profit target at 100% to take off just $25 worth, just for S and Gs, right? And I'm kind of amazed at how that's working. And that little Bitcoin position from doing this mining is actually worth something. And I'll reveal all that to you over time. Now, keep in mind, it's a little bit different than what I normally do, but this is just little crumbs that is going in. I'm going to see how big I can build it again. Once again, it's a game. And maybe once it becomes substantial, maybe when I get to one Bitcoin or 10 Bitcoins, I'll start putting a little money management in there. <laughs> of course I will once I get to one Bitcoin, but I'm just kind of being silly. But it's kind of a fun little experiment. And so that's 136% move. And by the way, these things will spike 100% overnight sometimes and then go right back in. And I got sick and tired of watching it happen over and over and over again. So I'm just putting in a little tiny order way up there at 100%. If it gets hit, then I get 25 bucks. And like I said, I'm putting it into Bitcoin. And otherwise, that spike would have just went up and then came right back in. So in a case like this, so it spiked 136 and let's say it comes back in. Well, that's $25 that I wouldn't have had because I'm still in a position. And let's say it does it. Well, so what? If it keeps on going, it goes up 200%, then I'm still in and I'm only $25 shy of my entire position. So y'all let me know if, if uh, you agree or disagree with this. Uh, leave a comment if you're on uh, YouTube. And I know you can't leave comments, but if there's something, if the comment you want to leave here on go to webinar, just leave a, just type it into questions. Anyway, mark to market on that 649. So 667 going in, and then 398 came off. And then mark to market 649. Mark to market last week, obviously, a little bit better. And then $25 just for SGs at 100%. That comes to $405 total out of 667. So that's a 60% return. So, so far, so good on that one. Here's another one, and you can see that this is just another one that's that's that I've held over a week. A week in crypto is like a year, right? If you could hold, but I think there's a potential, and that's why I'm saying old guys rule. The old guys who understand trend following, who understand money management, who understand trading psychology, understand the fact that you're trading traders and not markets, you're going to do really well. And you know, in crypto, here's the thing: you, you, I'm all gung ho about it. But believe me, I'll go days and sometimes weeks without making trades after everything just kind of pulls back like it has been as of late and just sit back and wait and then trade it more like the core methodology. In other words, trading the pullbacks. But this particular case, this one was going straight up. So I bought it, 1,000 bucks, 20% comes off. So that's $596. So think about $1,000, 20% is $1,200. You take off half. So there is a little commissions in there. That's probably why it's $4 shy of 600. $96 profit on that. And then this thing ran 65% total. And then the mark to market is 641. So let's take a look at that. 1,000 bucks, 596 off. Mark to market of 641. We add all that up. So it's $237 total. And that's a 23.70% return. Okay, as I said earlier, core methodology, this one's a, a new coin, at least was new to Coinbase. And you can see it initially took off. And sometimes you can just buy these things when they're going up. I think I tried to do that on this one. Maybe watch last week's week of charts. It didn't work. Uh, no, that was the pullback. I, I traded the pullback twice. Now, keep in mind with the core methodology, a pullback that looks like this, I would not stop out of it. I would just hang on and have a stop down. I wouldn't stop out of this position is what I'm trying to say. I would have a stop somewhere below this low plus a little wiggle room as opposed to saying, hey, this thing's not working and bail out on it when it begins to tail off its high and come back in. I'm not suggesting you micromanage like that, but if you buy something and it's coming back in and 20 other pairs are going straight up, then by all means, dump the one that's not working and jump in on the other one. The buses are coming by really quick. Now, if the market slows down a little bit or matures, like I said earlier, then of course you want to trade it more and more like the core methodology. Anyway, decent move in this one so far. This little cyan line up here is the 100% mark. When that hits, I'm going to take a whopping $25 off and put it in Bitcoin. It's kind of fun. So anyway, there's the orders. You can see the limit order up here. 
twenty-five dollars and change to cover the, the commission, and we'll see what happens. So let's add it all up. Four fifty-seven. Oh, put it four hundred fifty-seven dollars in this one. And you know the reason I'm I'm showing these small accounts is is to show you that you can trade. This is a golden opportunity. Now, this should not be your only bread and butter. I suggest you trade stocks and learn how to trade stocks. But this might be a wonderful way to get your reps in. And that's the secret to trading is getting your reps in, good, bad, and indifferent, getting used to placing the order, getting used to placing the additional profit target in there, getting used to placing a stop, getting used to being stopped out, and getting used to hanging on as long as you can, provided you're not stopped out. Get those reps in. And crypto is a way to get the reps in. I would not bet the form here. A lot of times I'm like, man, I should just dump a ton, a ton of money in here. But I think that's when things could get a little crazy. So do it at a small size, get your reps in, and I think you'll do just fine. So that's a 69% move. This one's uh, one of the better looking ones out of the pairs. This one actually went up from last week. So mark to market, this was decent, a whopping 321. But hey, you know, it's better than the poking eye. And again, my limit order is up here for 25 bucks. And then I'm gonna buy a whopping $25 worth of Bitcoin. So we add all this up, and it's $137 or 30% return, which uh, which ain't too bad if you think about it over a week or so, or a couple of weeks in this particular case. And again, annualizing is just absolutely ludicrous. Now, I do lose on occasion, and I think I showed you a loser last week, but a lot of the losses, especially when the market's running, I'm getting in, and I'm down 50 bucks or so or 75 bucks or whatever, and if there's other things that are running, I'll just bail on the one that's not running and get into another one and make that up really quickly. I'm not saying it works great uh, all, like this or this great or this well all the time because there are some drawdowns or some mornings I wake up and I'm kind of angry uh, because the market just got whacked. But that comes to the territory and I'm getting used to those reps, so to speak, in that such a volatile market. Anyway, any questions on crypto? Any thoughts about what I said so far? Agree, disagree? So here are the three recent mystery charts. Like I said last week, this one didn't trigger and began to implode. This one spent too many days trying to trigger, but this one actually did trigger. So let me reveal that. It's T-A-R-S, TARS. And if you want to see these trades, the archives, you can go to daylearn.com slash archives. That's absolutely free. You have to pay to see the live ones. That's DaveLearner.com slash trading service for the live ones. But anyway, there's a setup. The entry was in here. It triggered. It was kind of off to the races today. And then by the end of the day, unfortunately, it came back down and actually closed in the minus column. But it still looks pretty good as a potential trade. If you wanted to take it, I would maybe wait for it to take out this particular high in here and stop out somewhere below the low of the pullback. So here it is. Uh, let's see, TARS. It was 32.99 was the entry, protective stop of 25.54. Okay, and these risk parameters seem kind of crazy, I know, but that's what it calls for. Okay, like this video and please subscribe. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> like I said, last uh, 11, 12 weeks, I woke up. And this has to do with my morning pages, which I'll touch upon in just one second. And these are things I wish somebody would have told me a long time ago. And back in December, these are the 20 things that were in my head. There's the first 18, and here are the other two. And since then, I probably added 20 or 30 to them. And I realized that this week, um, in, in weeks prior, last few weeks, that we'll never get done with this. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up tonight. And then we could revisit it. And there's a lot of things that have kind of spawned off on this, so to speak, and a lot of notes and things that we'll be covering uh, soon. Anyway, so there must be 50 ways to lose your money. I did a presentation a few weeks back on this, things I wish I knew when I was just getting started. And one of them was the map is not the territory. So this is sort of the, the map is not the territory. And, and one thing that kind of reminds me of the map is not the territory, not to go too far off on a tangent, but imagine that you go off on a tangent. But years ago, I was I wrote an article for Stocks and Commodities in 1990. I wrote it in 90, 
95, I think it was published in 96, somewhere around that time. And there was this gentleman that was looking to put together a hedge fund. And he wanted me to be the technician to help follow his system, so to speak. And he did a lot of curve fitting and made a lot of problems. I mean, there was a lot of problems with it. And eventually I I quit the project just because it was it was too many problems. Had a lot of promise. You know, the wild enthusiasm phase was great. Uh, they, he claimed we'd have $100 million earmarked that uh, would go into it. And I started doing that math. We make 20% a year at least. And that's what a two times two is $4 million plus $2 million. So right out the gate, we're going to make $6 million a year. I don't know what piece of that I was going to get, but he made it seem like it was going to be a pretty big piece. But anyway, one thing I found out pretty quickly was his map was not the territory. And one thing I was thinking about as I was going live is, the options prices he was using in his model were wrong. He was he was just taking a snapshot of options. And if you traded options for more than one day, you take a look at the snapshot of options after the close. Those numbers aren't wrong, aren't right. You can't get options for what they're what they're saying they are or selling for what they say they are. You have to have a live and liquid market and then actually trade to see what you can really get. The other thing which was interesting was his one of his patterns was and i know i've said this before but i think it's important to mention one of his patterns was when a moving average ticked up that was a buy and a little bit more to it than that but for purposes of this story when the moving average ticked up that was a buy and and with certain other parameters and that conceptually made a lot of sense until i realized that he was using metastock or no no i'm sorry trade station at the time, the old trade station, we had a little dongle thing that goes in the back or whatever. And I realized at that point in time that if you have a price here and a price here, okay, and this price was higher, but off the screen, the moving average would turn up on this price, okay? So long story endless, he was, he was trading, so to speak, with his trading system, by using tomorrow's data which we don't have if i had tomorrow's data i'm sorry but you'd never see my fat ass again <laughs> so that was one of the problems with the system the map is not the territory and then there was a, a, a lot of other areas too but anyway so getting back to this there's there's 50 ways to lose your money and that's sort of dovetails in with the map is not the territory and this is what i'm saying there's as i do these things i keep thinking of more and more so i just randomly picked one of mine and this happened to me a while back. You're really hungry for lunch, but you need to get an order in. So you place your stop entry order and you're in a hurry. And I might've had a dentist appointment or I might've had something going on, I forget. But I knew I was in a hurry to get out of my office and, and probably I think it was just hungry knowing me. And then I quickly hit the three confirm clicks. So this brokerage account that I have, one of them at least, or one of my bigger accounts, and it's it was, it requires you to click enter and then there might be some kind of warning about something or whatever about the order you're placing and then enter enter so so i'm always like once i'm happy with the order i hit click 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 and then i i then i'm done well i've done that for years okay and then not all that long ago they changed the system and they put in another warning screen or like or you're really really sure screen and I ended up not getting a trade. So I, I came in from lunch or wherever I was and the stock is up three points and I'm feeling pretty smug and I feel pretty smart and patting myself on the back. And then I pull up my brokerage account to exit half and there's no shares in my account. I'm like, what the is going on here? And so apparently the broker and the infinite kindness added another layer of paternalism by adding a fourth, are you sure? And it might've been something like uh, this type of order is this or whatever. And overnight they changed how they do that. And I was such in a routine of going click, 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 one, two, three, and I'm in. Then all of a sudden now I gotta click four times, okay? So I was very upset. Now, technically, I know I just said 50 ways to lose your money. Now, te technically I didn't lose anything, but I've done the same thing once with a trailing stop and the trailing stop they had they added an extra warning about stops and trailing stops and blah 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 and i didn't click that fourth time or whatever and i was in something with a this was an intraday trade but i was in something with like a one point stop or something 
and the thing ran like five points and then dropped the point. And I looked at my screens and I see, and one account is like, it all worked perfectly. And I'm like, well, I've got a bigger position over here. Let me go count my money over there. And then I looked and I was actually down a shit ton. And I'm like, God, darn it. You know, I said more than that, believe me, dropped a couple F-bombs. But again, there must be 50 ways to lose your money. There's all kinds of things you could do to lose money trading. You could fat finger on order and end up with 100 times what you intended, especially something like options. You're trying to buy 10, you buy 100, uh, you know, just all kinds of things. Um, the default screen sometimes, like in one of my platforms, the default screen used to be whatever, um, used to be 100 or something, and that carried over options and ended up with like 100 options, like 100 shares for stocks. That 100 showed up in my options screen, and I just hit enter and thinking that's buying a contract or 10 contracts or whatever, and ended up buying 100. I've done that more than once. Now, by the way, this example just showed you no money was lost, but there was a huge opportunity cost. And believe me, not winning when you should have won, at least for me, is far harder than losing money. And I'm sure if I did a little digging into psychology and neurology, there's probably some science that backs that up. Anyway, I would like to hear stupid things or non-stupid things. Like, I don't think that's stupid that I didn't click the four time. It's stupid, I guess, because I wasn't paying attention because I just was in a habit of doing things a certain way. I try to act mechanically or as mechanically as possible, even though I'm a discretionary trader. And I ended up with, in one case, losing money because the stop didn't go in. And another case, like I just said, and probably more than one case, when they changed the order system up a little bit, I ended up not in a position at all. So let me know some of the 50 ways that you lost money trading that you weren't aware of. The map is not the territory. You look at the little Landry Light pullback. Oh, yeah, look, looks like a great setup. It pulls down to the moving average. Step one, step two, step three, pick your money up. Well, when you go to actually do that, a lot of times it's a lot harder than I said. As I've been saying lately, I got in this little QQQ trade on the TFM 10% system, and I'll have a um, presentation on my website, DaveLearner.com, tomorrow on that from your daily five from stock chart show from a stock chart show that I that I've done. And anyway, I show that okay, I got in this little Q position. I'm like, I'm gonna buy 100 shares. Who cares? And follow this system mechanically. And then that little 100 shares has gone up 120 something points as accused of making brand new highs. I never dreamed it would go up that far that fast. And here's the thing the stop is so far away based on the system. I would lose half of that 12K. I would have to give up 60 points if I continue to follow that system. Now, I didn't build a lot of money management. I didn't, well, I didn't build any money management into the system because that was not the original designer's intent. The intent was to just get you out of the way. When the market sold off. When you're just getting started, you feel like, what's wrong with me? Why is trading such a struggle? Why is it so damn hard? What am I doing wrong? What's wrong with me? Well, there's nothing wrong with you, okay? Trading is friggin' hard, okay? I'm not gonna be like one of these um, gurus, you know, sitting on a tarmac in a pretend jet or whatever and tell you how easy it is. And some of those guys are going to jail, but that's another story. I'm not being shot on Friday, but I think if you're bilking clients out of money, you should go to jail. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm just the opposite of those guys. I tell you, it's hard, right? But that's okay. If you're struggling, that's good. There's always going to be a struggle when it comes to trading. Even, even these professionals that I know, luckily, through I've been lucky enough to know through the circles, I've been able to travel and all around the world. It's been fantastic. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I'm, I feel like I'm blessed. It's kind of a pinch me moment to be around some of these guys. I know that they struggle in their trading, whether they tell you outright or not. And kind of a long story, but at the bar, the the novice trader who who wins a little in a trade, he's bragging about how great he did. And then the more professional, the well-seasoned trader, he talks about how he could have done much better. Or he tells you how he got his ass handed to him here and there. And you know this person is making a shit ton of money, but that's their kind of way of of thinking and the way they see things. Annie Duke actually talked about that too. Phil Helmuth, I think that's his name. 
and she talks about him and then there's another guy who's like kind of calm and uh phil's always bragging at the bar about how well he did and the other guy i can't see him uh i can't think of his name anyway at the bar he's always talk even if he won the tournament he's like man i botched that third hand in that third game you know it's like he's like what <laughs> you know it's like you just won the tournament so different kind of attitude um any duke's book thinking in bets i'd recommend you read it the only thing i was a little let down with is, is i think if memory serves her solution to all this was was um have a support mechanism of, of other people to help you and i guess you know in hindsight that's probably not a bad idea because that's what we're doing with the facebook group dave landry's trend traders but um I was kind of looking for more solutions, but it's a very good book. I, I'd urge you to read it. If you go to davelander.com slash books dash two dash read, I have a list of books I'd recommend you read. So anyway, getting back to this, trading will always be a struggle. It does get easier over time, but it never gets easy. And when it does, that's when you're in for a spanking. So should it ever feel easy? Rest assured that you're about a minute away from getting your ass handed to you. I have a, a client I've been friendly with for, for years. It goes all the way back to the 90s and the trading market days, and he's been my client forever. I love the guy. We are uh, we haven't met in person. We're always threatening to to meet up somewhere, but we never seem to be able to to meet up. But uh super guy. And it either it goes both ways too, but uh Whenever I'm bragging to him about how I knocked it out of the park, the next day I get crushed. And this kind of goes a little longer term too. Like it's like, man, I've been hitting out the park for the last several weeks. And then boy, I, I just next three or four weeks are just gonna suck. So if ever you feel really good, just say, hey, wait a minute. This, this is not supposed to be that easy. I have to I had to work really hard to finally get to this point where I make a lot of money. Now I need to sit on it and not just piss it away on the next thing that comes along and recognize that, yeah, I'm great because I traded and made all this money, but also the conditions were great and tomorrow the conditions are going to be different. So don't stress if you're struggling. Now, here's a, here's a biggie. When you first start trading, you... You go on a grail hunt. We all go on a grail hunt. I've got an email from somebody. I talked about the grail hunt and how instead of just doing something simple, we go on a grail hunt. And um, I haven't answered the guy yet, but I'm looking forward to talking with him. And a smart guy, but he tried to outsmart the market early on. It took him years. It usually takes about 10 years to just do kind of like the trend following moron stuff. But average intelligence is, is more than enough. Like somebody calls me up and says um, they're a physicist or some kind of engineer or something. I'm like, ooh, you know, you, a rocket scientist. You might be too smart for trading. Early in my career, by someone I have the utmost respect for, it was a bit of an idol of mine. And one day I'm going to tell the whole story. I've got the whole story written out, and uh, I'm just kind of sitting on it. But he called me a trend following moron. Now it was an anonymous email, but I know it was him, okay? Because I called him by name and the emails immediately stopped. He started hit sending me harassing emails. And what happened was the reason digest of the story is he told me he's never seen anyone with the uncanny uncanny ability to predict markets. And all I was doing was calling them as I saw them. We were in a rip-roaring bull market. I was drawing the big blue arrows. I was recommending stock after stock after stock, and they were going straight up. And as I've said a thousand times, there was one stock I mentioned in my column, my free column, and uh, you know, 50 ways to lose your money, right? The next day, I forgot to check it, and when I check it, checked it, it was up 58 points. I think it was Red Hat, and I'm like, oh my god! And it made like a really little orderly entry it just kind of went up and hit where the entry would have been and it kind of meandered went up a, a few cents and you know whatever and then all of a sudden took off 58 points and that that's that's one trade that i'll never forget like i said earlier it's much more painful like i cannot remember i'd have to think a little bit i'm sure i could come up with something but on the fly i can't remember any losses that caused me pain i have plenty of them believe me 
But if I start thinking about missed opportunities, that one comes to mind. I could think of one where I probably would have had on a thousand shares and it would have went up maybe $2 million or something like that. I mean, it had a whole bit, you know, it's all hypothetical, but still it's like the entry was there, the stock was there, all the pieces fit and I missed that trade. But anyway, long story endless, this gentleman I'm assuming was shorting the markets. In fact, I know one market, he was very short and it kept going up. And this is when it got ugly between us and he called me a trend following moron. Initially, I was crushed. I was devastated. But over the next few weeks, I noticed when I tried to outsmart the market, I would lose money. When I followed along like the little trend folly moron I was, I did okay. And you know, not every day, of course, but I did much better than what I tried to outsmart the market. And William Eckert, I later stumbled across this, once said, I haven't seen much correlation between good trading and intelligence. Some outstanding traders are quite intelligent, but few aren't. Many outstanding intelligent people are horrible traders. Amen. I've seen that throughout my career on the educational side. Average intelligence is enough. Beyond that, emotional makeup is more important. Amen, my brother from the another mother, my brother Bill from another mother. Now, people who are really smart, they they want to know why exactly a stock goes up or goes down, and and they want to think in exacts and, and and it's very hard a lot of times for an accountant to become a successful trader because they like to think in exacts and markets are a little bit more esoteric than that remember you're trading traders not markets and everything is moved on emotions and you can't eliminate you can't eliminate your own emotions as they often say that's neurology you have to embrace your emotions and then figure out a way to take advantage of the other people's emotions you have to look for that greater fool you are greater fool hunting. You need somebody to come along and buy this stock from you higher than what you bought it. Anyway, the physicists and all these people who deal in exacts, accountants, et cetera, engineers, they're always like, where exactly do I do this? Surgeons uh, have a hard time. You know, you know who's actually damn good at trading? Pilots. Pilots, pilots from what I've seen, make the best traders. You know why? Because they have checklists, okay? And they do what they're supposed to do, and they have to learn how to be calm in what they do. And I know some, I know some pilots specifically, and they tell stories about, yeah, we lost an engine and everything, and I just kind of chilled out for a second, caught, you know, gained my thoughts, and and made sure I didn't shut off the other engine. Because in a panic situation, you might say the engine's on, the engine's uh, shut off or whatever. I'm sorry, the engine's not working, better shut it down. You know, it's like, well, let's just see if it catches fire or whatever, then we'll deal with it. And the reason, this one particular story, I don't want to, I don't know if it's, he's free, I'm free to share the story. But anyway, the reason that they didn't shut it down is because there's a chance in the heat of the moment that you shut down the working engine and they were on a landing. Uh, approach and had they done that they would have crashed okay people don't realize i don't know a lot about flying but i do know that the plane's kind of dropping out of the sky when you're landing you have to you have to slow the plane down to where it drops and if you lose you lose all the engines you don't have enough speed to get back up likely but anyway but they they make good traders because they have checklists and and they don't just fly by the seat of their pants so to speak they actually Check the list. Okay, hey, did we put the landing gear down? And and I asked Greg Morris once. He was an ex-pilot. He was a fighter pilot and a commercial pilot. And I'm like, hey, Greg, you know, these things that are on the list is it because somebody forgot to put the landing gear down. He's like, absolutely. So every little mistake or whatever, they they come up with a checklist and they go from there. So pilots actually smart people that can actually trade. Now I've been presenting all these issues, and like I said, it started with 20. We probably ended up with 60 of these things. And I'll probably come up with more over time. But the thing is, there's there's only three ways to deal with all these issues, which you don't know when you're starting trading. And as you learn all these different issues, there's only three ways for you to deal with them. I ate a handful of spicy <laughs> snack mix right before I got started. Big mistake. Uh, number one, document. Number two, document. And number three, document. Now, in your trading journal, obviously you're gonna do a lot of documentation. 
and obviously you want to do the mechanics you want to you want to write why it's an fes setup and and don't take anything less than an fes setup am i guilty yes am i interviewing myself yes <laughs> but it had an fes setup is a setup you look at it and you're like F yeah you feel like you must take this trade there's the must take trade as i've talked about before and there's the mistake trade okay take the must take trades and don't take the mistake trades a lot of times and jesse livermore said it first that i know of sometimes a speculator makes mistakes and knows he is making them correction paul one of the apostles said it first he said um and i, I don't know exactly the direct quote or whatever but he said uh, i know not to do these things but i do them anyway well that's a that's a lot of trading that's a lot of the battle but of course you want to say where you're going to get in and where you're going to take partial profits how you're going to trail your stop as a general statement and so on and so forth why you like the setup does the market action match it is the trend accelerating is this trend persisting is the pullback deep enough but maybe not too deep et cetera, et cetera. And I have a whole list of these that we'll go through in upcoming presentations, I promise. There's another piece to it too, though. You also wanna talk about how you're doing. It's something as simple as, I'm hungry, okay? And so I'll write, I'm hungry. And, and now that I religiously work out, people, you know, people who don't know me, people in the gym, like this guy's, a, uh, he's in here every day he's he's disciplined and all and i don't feel like i'm that disciplined i just go every day i guess that's a definition of discipline but anyway but now that i'm seriously doing a lot of weightlifting and have been for a few years now it's like I, i'm hungry and, and when i have to eat i have to eat also i have a little bit of an undiagnosed sugar problem or maybe i just like to eat i don't know <laughs> your your is it your frontal cortex or whatever when you're engaged in mental activity like trading, of course, which is extreme mental activity, you're burning a ridiculously, a ridiculous amount of sugar. And so that'll make you hungry too. But again, you wanna document your emotions, like how are you, and it doesn't have to be something crazy, like a major life crisis you're dealing with, which you should document, obviously. It could be something like, I'm hungry, you know? and and one of my things I've been guilty of lately is I don't leave the office much, but lately I've been having a little appointment here and there or something I have to take care of outside of the house, like a dental appointment or whatever. You know, they set you up like every six months or whatever, one of those things. And I'm, I'm looking at the markets like oh, they look pretty good. I'm not quite ready to get in, but you know what I'm going to do? Let me just let me just put on a position now because I don't want to miss it while I'm sitting in the dentist chair. And that's kind of a stupid thing. To do so in in your trading journal, write that hey, uh, I like this. It's not quite ready, but I'm gonna go ahead and take it because I have to go to the dentist and I don't want to miss it. You know, it's like and that's not a good reason to trade. Okay. So, is there any FOMO? Um, whenever I sometimes when I interact with 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 you guys, I get a little FOMO when especially when I see you guys grabbing getting something that I didn't get. Uh, the aforementioned gentleman, he's a pretty good scalper, and his trading horizon is much smaller than mine. And a lot of times I'll see him knock it out the park at some of these these uh, crazy crypto stocks like Myra, Riot, or whatever. And then I'll find myself wanting to jump in on that kind of like a goad. I'll let myself be goaded into it. So a lot of things like boredom and and just walked into the office, like I said, a thousand times. Uh, it's the hangry judge effect thing I talked about quite a bit. I'll go in the house, I'll eat lunch, and then I'm feeling better. And then I come back to the office and all of a sudden everything looks great. Uh, are you being affected by extraneous influences? And the answer to that is yes. Do you need money or do you have money? Uh, did you have a, a fight with your spouse, your significant other, or, or both? You know, uh, there's always going to be something kind of uh, eating at you, Gilbert, Gilbert Grape implied. Anyway, so now I'm going to change your life, promise, and vastly improve your pages. So every morning when you wake up, you need to write three handwritten pages. And years ago, I did this. It's called a brain. I called it a brain dump. And I don't know if that's the original term or not. That's what I called it. 
And then, uh, I don't know, forget it, probably five years ago, I got a book by Julia Cameron. And I, I think I was, back then, I was trying to learn how to draw. I can't really draw that well. And every now and then I like to draw things that, I'm, that I want to build or, or whatever, just kind of mess around a little. And I got a hold of that book thinking it would help me become an artist. And I never bothered reading the whole book. I read the first few pages and she talked about morning pages. I'm like, oh, that's a brain dump thing I used to do. And I found some of those, those brain dumps from 30 years ago. And I'm like, I was amazed at the things I wrote. And I wish I'd have kept um, writing them. There's a Carolina Wren outside my door. You guys can hear that? Anyway, um, Julia Cameron kind of is the person who got me back into these because in her book, she talks about the artist, the um, the morning pages. Now, I don't do everything she says to a T. I'm not, I don't get that esoteric like the, she says create characters of yourself, like different personalities. There's a doubting part of you. There's a confident part of you and all that. I don't get into all that. I just write three handwritten pages. And what I would encourage you to do is stay analog the best you can. Now, I stay analog with the caveat that I use a digital tablet and I love this thing. I've have I have thousands and thousands and thousands of pages that I've written in this and I just absolutely love it. Um but I try to stay analog as much as possible. You don't want especially somebody like me, I gotta quit saying the habit because I feel like it's it's making it worse by talking about it. But I have a little ADD issue and it's it's undiagnosed, but my wife sure seems to think so. And you know, that and sleep apnea, your wife's are pretty good at diagnosing or your spouses. And if I wake up in the morning, if I don't do this right away, I'll get torn in a hundred different directions, especially with markets and emails and clients and all this other stuff. You have to put a pause on all that. It, it, there's a recently, I started reading a little bit of a book called Limitless and, and he goes into the, the fact that when you start pulling your brain in all these different directions you're burning that sugar out the front of your brain your frontal cortex and it's really bad for you all this multi-processing so wake your brain up slowly do these morning pages it's like you you just as you do things like this you find over time more and more reasons to support them and that's one of them so try to stay analog now truth be told i do i do check the crypto when I first wake up. I, I try not to get into stocks and all that. And, and keep in mind, I'm up pretty early. I'm up around, right around five o'clock. My alarm is set at 4.55. And don't don't try to make this war and peace or your, your magnum opus, okay? It's not, you're just getting thoughts out of your head. Although you might occasionally stumble into something, some bits and pieces like the 20 things I wrote that I wish I'd have known when I first got started. That just came out of nowhere. That's one of the things that will happen is you will, you're not gonna get a huge epiphany, especially not right away, but you're going to get some little epiphanies over time. And again, just write down everything. It's like, you know, I got an old dog farts a lot, you know? And I'm always like, did it smell that bad when you ate it? And I'm thinking, well, she eats her own poo. So yeah, maybe. Uh, I hope nobody's uh, getting ready to sit down for supper. But, you know, write it down and oh, I don't know what to write. Well, write down, I don't know what to write, okay? Uh, is somebody or something pissing you off? Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, beyond a shadow of a doubt, right? There's always something to worry about. There's always something aggravating you. You wanna keep the pen moving, okay? Uh, if you think of something urgent, and you will eventually, believe me, uh, sands the house burning down, you want to just put a little star next to it in your notes or just make a note on, on a separate page and, and forget about it for a minute and get back to your get back to your writing and just bang those pages out. Give yourself a few weeks before reading them. I think Julia Cameron said like six weeks or something before you go back and read them. Um, that was really hard for me to do. And now I have year, I'm years behind on rereading what I wrote. Yeah. I, and usually if there's something important in it, I'll put a star. And luckily with this notebook, I could uh, put a tag next to it. So if it's something that I, that goes in a book I'm writing, I'll put a little tag on that. I have a book I'm writing called Trend of Thought. I've got a thousand, it's probably up to about 1400 now, handwritten pages again in this notebook, just on that book. And 
I'm not saying that every day you're going to get some great, something great out of it, but you can kind of go in and look at where your mindset is at the time, okay, it, it what you're doing, and, and I'm guilty of doing things that are avoiding avoidance behavior. I kind of get heavily in the hobbies that try to keep my um, keep my sanity, but if I'm writing three pages just about hobbies, I'm probably avoiding something or whatever. Anyway, you're going to make them your own and do your own, and I swear you're going to be amazed in doing this. One of the biggest things that came out of, of me doing these morning pages initially was worries, and, and there's always something to worry about, believe me, and 87% of what I worried about never came true, which I found amazing, especially when I go back and read six weeks. You know, I really need to go. I'm, I'm glad I'm doing this presentation. I need to go back in and read all the stuff that I've written. And 87% seems to never come true. And you wonder why you bothered worried about it in the first place. Now, I'm not saying throw caution to the wind, but just realize a lot of stuff you're worried about is going to work itself out. Now, of the 13% that doesn't, or that does come true, 10% of that turns out to really not be that big of a deal. You're like, why was I ever worried about this? Now, of the 3% that does, if that much, and as I'm putting this together, 3% might actually be a big, big number. You just deal with it. And you find that you find yourself surprised at how you niche up to it. And, and, and maybe, and I'm just thinking about this as we're talking here tonight, Maybe the reason you were able to Nietzsche up, and Nietzsche is what doesn't destroy me, his, his most famous quote, which doesn't destroy me makes me stronger, or as Norm MacDonald used to say, what it doesn't destroy me makes me very, very, very weak. But anyway, I, I think through the notes, it's really going to help your dealing with the problems because you, you'll, you're forced to face them a little bit. If you just start getting everything out of your head, you will write down those worries and concerns. And that's going to be part of your notes. Uh, the big thing is your trading issues, and you know, ask questions while you write, and and don't beat yourself up too much. But one of the things I used to write is like, why do I make such stupid trades every time I walk to the office? As well, because I was hungry when I left the office, likely, and then I got lunch, and I went to breakfast, and then came back into the office, and then it felt good. It's like, duh. But in the meantime, while you're doing stupid stuff, you realize that, hey, you're becoming the definition of insanity. Maybe I should stop doing that. And even though I don't know why I'm doing this, these bad behaviors, I could stop doing them until I figure it out. So, again, you don't want to become the definition of insanity, and your morning pages will flesh that out because you keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. Now, I promise you that if you do these morning pages, it's going to improve your trading and it's going to improve your life. Be warned, they ain't easy, okay? Especially when you're first getting started. And I'm sure there's one of you out there because I've been preaching doing these things for five years, but I can't think of one person who's actually done them after all of my encouragement. There's been three people specifically, maybe more in the gym that have asked me to help them become traders. And the first thing I do is I tell them to write three handwritten pages every day. And out of those three, none have done it in spite of my preaching. So I, I can't think of one person, maybe one of you guys, please let me know. Please let me know in the comments if you actually done them because that would be flattering for me that you did. Now, the good news is it gets easier over time. I literally can't wait. I guess I shouldn't say that. Uh, that's an overused term. But anyway, I really can't wait to get out of bed sometimes. So I'm like, oh man, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. And then it's like, oh, okay, I could I could do my morning pages first. And that actually, I'm actually excited to do that. I'm a nerd, but this is really good stuff. It's really powerful stuff. And I used to hate to write. I would, if I in college, if there was a, a term paper due, I would, I would, I would go ask the teacher first day, is there a term paper? <laughs> if there was, I'd cut the class and eventually I had to learn how to write, but that's another story. But don't uh, don't try to write anything eloquent. Just get what's ever in your head. All right, let's shift gears and go to crypto. And if anybody has any questions, uh, let me know. Let me check uh, Facebook. Again, I'm sorry, Facebook. Uh, YouTube. All right, I'm going to switch gears. Let's go to crypto real quick. I'm running a little slow tonight. I'm running a little late tonight, I should say. So let's take a look at... 
the uh, let's see if we can get this up. Just one second. Okay, let's go to. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Bitcoin, nice little landry light -like pullback. I think we might have some fits and starts. I don't think it's going to work in such a textbook manner just because everybody seems to be fighting it out in Bitcoin. The spot ETF was introduced. It obviously, Bitcoin imploded from that and then it took off. And so now we're kind of in, in meandering back and forth and everybody's trying to figure out crypto. I think Bitcoin's here to stay. I think 